Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Recipe Share, a program on AADL TV, where we take a few minutes to share recipes from a featured category. Today's category is Easy on the Tummy. I'm Beth, and I'm joined today by Katie and Elizabeth, but also our friend Jacob, who's going to tell us a little bit about why we chose this topic, Easy on the Tummy, and how it relates to the Big Gay Read. Yes, I am so glad to be here with you. Um, Recipe Share ladies, and thank you for having me in the Big Gay Read. The Big Gay Read, uh, we've been doing it for, this is our fourth year now, and we select a book um, for the public to engage with that deals with uh, queerness in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Um, and then we plan a series of events around that book that for the folks who did read the book, it's kind of a, a deeper dive into the topics and, and what have you. But also these events that we've planned are for anybody to come and enjoy, whether you've heard of the Big Gay Read, whether you've read one page, one chapter, or none of it. Um, so this year's Big Gay Read is We Are Never Meeting in Real Life by uh, Samantha Irby. Now this is different from uh, other books we've chosen in the past because it's a collection of essays and it's definitely um it, it sits firmly in the humor genre uh samantha irby writes uh very autobiographically and shares a lot from her personal life in these essays and uh she um something that she experiences in her daily life is uh, digestive issues which she talks about very humorously in the book um but today we're going to offer some recipes that hopefully will be easy on your tummy. Now, we are not doctors. We are not medical professionals. These are just recipes that may work for you if you are um, looking for something that's a little bit easy on the tummy. Um, do you mind, do you guys mind if I go first? Wonderful. So my recipe uh, is something I make almost every week mostly because it's made out of stuff that I have in my fridge or in my um, pantry. So um, my recipe is for kimchi fried rice. Um, I understand that fermented foods such as kimchi, which is like a Korean fermented uh, cabbage, radish, vegetable type of thing, um, can be good for your gut health, give you all those good nutrients. Um, not nutrients, the word I'm looking for is little uh, happy germs. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. That'll make your tummy happy. In this particular recipe, um, we're gonna use brown rice, which is uh, great to digest and um, gets you moving, Gets the, all that fiber gets you moving. So how I make my kimchi fried rice is I start by um, dicing an onion and chopping as much garlic as I want or, or chop as much garlic until somebody looks at you and thinks that you are losing your mind because <laughs> um, I love garlic. Now, if you know that onions and garlic is not vibing with your tummy, you can totally skip this part. Um, the flavor of the kimchi fried rice is coming from the kimchi. Anything else is just kind of added extra fun. So I dice my onion up, I get all my garlic together, and I also roughly chop one cup of kimchi. Now you can get this I, uh, at basically Myers, Kroger, any big grocery store. I like to go to uh, the Asian grocery stores around me because that kimchi tends to be a little bit funkier. The kimchi I'm getting at Kroger and stuff is almost closer to sauerkraut, honestly, than it is to... Um, the kimchi I'm getting at these Asian markets. Kimchi tastes funky. Um, it should taste funky. When you open that jar up, you should see some bubbles, some fermentation bubbles. All that good flavor is what makes this um, particular dish wonderful. So you got all your diced onions or garlic, or maybe you don't, and you got your chopped up kimchi. 
And actually, let me backtrack a little bit. The day before, and this is not, you, you can do it a different way too. But in my opinion, fried rice is best with day old cold rice. Totally not necessary, but it is something that I, I have found makes my fried rice tastier. So you're basically going to cook one cup of your um, dried brown rice. Um, so that's one cup and then whatever the directions say. Your one cup of dried rice is going to make three cups of big, fluffy, yummy rice. So, you know, throw it in the fridge or if you have something left over, or you can use it right after you cook it too. Just a little, little tip is that I like that cold, older rice. So you got your hot pan and maybe uh, throw in some sesame oil if you got it, or just olive oil or vegetable oil, any neutral oil will be great. I do love that flavor of the sesame oil in this particular dish. And I'm gonna throw my onion in. And I, I like to char my onion in this a little bit. Not so much golden brown, as I get some char on it. Uh, that flavor comes through really nicely. So you're gonna do your onion up, throw in your garlic and your kimchi, and you're gonna cook all that through for about three minutes. Um, three minutes or until a good amount of that kimchi liquid is absorbed or uh, dissipates, if you will. Then you're gonna add your cooked rice, letting it brown a little bit in the hot oil. So you're gonna dump in your rice and your first instinct might be to start breaking it up. I'm telling you to leave it there a little bit so the rice gets a little bit brown itself um, and then start breaking it up. So you got your rice in there. I like to drizzle maybe a tablespoon or two of soy sauce over my rice. And then I take as much leftover kimchi liquid from my jar as I'd like to add, that's when I add it. Now it could be a quarter cup, it could be a half cup. If you're feeling real spicy and dicey, you can do three quarters cup. But that liquid gold of the kimchi juice from your jar, pour that over your rice and all your other good stuff and just stir it until you incorporate. Now you could really serve the dish then. Um, I like to add some, if I got it in my freezer, I'll add some frozen peas and carrots. Or um, if I wanna turn it more, more into a meal rather than a side dish, I'll make a little, little um, well in my fried rice. I'll push all the fried rice to the side and make a little circle, spray that with cooking oil, and I'll scramble up some eggs nice and hard, hard in there. You wanna make sure you're, Eggs are, are cooked nice and hard because if you, they're a little bit wet, you'll get like a carbonara effect on your rice. You want to cook your scrambled eggs nice and hard um, and then mix that in as well. And that's very um, optional. It's really what you would like to do and uh, what sits well on your tummy. Now, of course, you could throw some um, chopped up green onions on top. You could throw some. Um, everything but the bagel seasoning, because I like the sesame seeds in there. And I like the big flaky garlic and onion um, to garnish your dish. But it really is as simple as that. Sounds really good. It is so tasty and it's it's so quick. Really, yeah. all you got to do is make sure you got that jar of kimchi in your fridge and you're, you're cruising. I like I like the idea of using that instead of just kimchi on its own. Sometimes I've had it as a side, but yeah, very interesting, Jacob. Yeah, definitely. Like I I'm used to making fried rice like pretty similarly, except for the addition of the kimchi. So that's that's really interesting to me. Very cool. Yeah, it's tasty, it delicious, definitely. And I love how you can add so easy to modify you know like throw some green onions on there throw some like you could just do whatever which is the those are my favorite kind of dishes yeah also ginger mm -hmm. oh ginger would be great in that and i always find that i buy the ginger in the squeezy tube but mm -hmm. i never use it fast enough so it's a great way or to, to use that up or some green pepper or maybe you want to um you got some frozen corn you want to stir in 
It's whatever you got in the fridge and whatever you want to eat. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, Katie, do you mind telling us about your dish? Not at all. I would love to. So, um, first of all, I kind of want to acknowledge the fact that I have been sharing a ton of chicken recipes lately. And I just want to say this is it, right? This is it. I'm sharing this chicken recipe and then I'm done for a while. But I'm super proud of this recipe because it's one that my husband and I worked on developing for a long time. And we actually tried this like it feels like so many times before we got it to what I consider to be like just perfect. So um, this recipe is for gluten and dairy free chicken tenders. So um, chicken tenders are fried chicken tenders specifically are one of my husband's and I's favorite food. We love this. Um, but for like the longest time, years and years, I had to eat gluten free and I'm just like starting to reincorporate gluten ba back into my diet. And so I eat kind of like what I say, like gluten light <laughs> these days. So I still appreciate a really good gluten free recipe. And we also wanted to make this recipe dairy free because as my husband gets older, he's finding that he's becoming more and more lactose intolerant. So we really had some goals for this, right? Like gluten-free, dairy-free, and then like really important to us was that we make this with items that you can find in your kitchen or your pantry on the regular, not something like as much as I appreciate some of the substitution and different flours and things that are available like almond, chickpea flour, those are great. Milk substitutes are awesome that we can get that, but I really wanted it to be like stuff that you just usually already have so that was a big goal we tried a bunch we think we finally succeeded so this is how you do it so you um heat up some peanut oil in a dutch oven until it gets to 370 while that's heating up you take your chicken tenders and you can make chicken tenders by slicing up a chicken breast but you can also be lazy like me and just buy them already cut up from the store put them in your Ziploc bag and you coat them with lemon juice and you let them sit for about 10 minutes. We found that this really is a nice trick to getting that coating sticking to your chicken. So that's an important step. And then you're gonna have three separate bowls. So in your first bowl is a large bowl. You're gonna mix cornstarch, salt, baking powder, paprika, pepper, garlic powder, and onion powder. And then you take about a third of that and you move it to a medium sized bowl. So you've got two bowls with your dry ingredients in it. And then in your third bowl, you beat up an egg with, with a tablespoon of water. Okay, then you take your chicken tenders, put it in the medium bowl, the one that has the less dry ingredients in it, shake that, um, and then you submerge it in your egg mixture and then in your large bowl to coat and then onto a wire rack. And you just repeat this process. So dry mixture, wet mixture, dry mixture, rack until everything is coated. And then you take each piece and you dip it in that large bowl again. And now that I'm saying this, I realized that I forgot a very important step, which is once that once you beat your egg with water, in that bowl, you just take a spoonful of that egg mixture and you drizzle it into your large bowl with your dry ingredients. This is gonna give you some little extra crispy bits as you're coating your chicken. So that is a pretty important step. Don't forget that. Once you have um, all of your chicken coated, you went through the steps and then you coated them once again in your dry mixture. You're going to fry them up in your oil. You can do about three at a time, about three minutes, then flip it three minutes on the other side. And what we like to do is to keep a uh, oven heated to about 200 degrees, just warm with a wire rack on a pan inside. And so as you're finishing frying the chicken, you can just pull it into the wire rack, keep it warm until you're done with your whole entire batch, and then just serve with your favorite sauce. And these come out just like the best chicken tenders I've definitely ever made at home with the add bonus, added bonus of them being gluten-free and dairy-free as well. So there you have it. How long did you say that, did you say how long it took you guys to perfect this um, 
methodology? I don't know how long in like time, but I know that we definitely tried the recipe at least three times before. Okay. Probably four. I bet it was four or five times. Honestly, now that I'm thinking about like how many iterations there were, because we started out with just like a recipe that you find on the internet, right? And it's like, okay, well, this mm -hmm. piece isn't working and then let's fix this. And so, yeah, I think probably about five different times till we were like, oh, this is perfect. And the perfectness comes from the texture and the color of the coating, really. That's where we were kind of like getting it wrong, where it's like, oh, it still tastes good. But like, that's not like, that's not the chicken tender is not supposed to be pale, right? It's supposed to be like golden. And so, yeah, that was the, the most of the trial, I think. Two questions. Was it crunchy? Yes, that's part of getting it perfect. The crunchy. Okay. It's that step I was telling you about with the egg, dripping it into the, um, into the dry mixture that really definitely gives you a little bit of extra crunch, which is really nice. Okay. And then what do you dip it in? I like barbecue sauce. That's my favorite. I like a spicy barbecue sauce, but you know, you can do hot sauce, um, go Buffalo style with this, you know, your basic ranch or really honey mustard, whatever you want. Okay. Sounds good. That lemon juice trick. I had never heard of that before. Yeah. And that was a new one for me too. And I couldn't taste the lemon juice. My husband said he could taste it a little bit, but it was giving it like a nice tang. So it wasn't like, like noticeable in a weird way. He said, I can, I can taste it, but it tastes good. So I was like, okay, well, I can't really taste it. Especially once I've got my spicy barbecue sauce on there, probably. <laughs> Seems like uh, it might tenderize it. Maybe. I don't know. Oh yeah, definitely. That could be part of it for sure. Okay. Okay. Well, Elizabeth, tell us about your easy on the tummy recipe, please. Okay. Well, I'd like to apologize to our viewers for my silly headphones, but um, <laughs> that's what works for me. I'm in my office. So anyway, um, my recipe comes from the book Cooking in Real Life. Um, and it's for Taverna salad, which is... Um, Basically, it says it's a combination of a classic Greek salad and fatouche, kind of. And I chose this because it is so easy to modify based on what you can, what your like dietary needs are. So the way that the um, recipe is written is basically um, you whisk together um, a third of a cup of olive oil, um, some red wine vinegar, um, um some minced garlic and some oregano and then season with salt and pepper and then in a large bowl you combine some chopped tomatoes a can of rinsed chickpeas one orange or yellow bell pepper half an english cucumber some kalamata olives chopped fresh parsley um capers a few tablespoons and then um oh a shallot and um some a couple scallions and you toss that together with the dressing that you've made and then meanwhile you have some um you have a piece of pita bread that you chop into one inch pieces drizzle with olive oil sprinkle with salt and then add them to a skillet and toast it until it's golden brown um you could also use pita chips she said if you wanted to skip that step but i enjoyed making it fresh um and then you know me, I love my um, halloumi cheese. So you drizzle, you have some halloumi that you've sliced and you use the same skillet as you used the pita, as you did the pita in and you cook that until golden brown and cut that, that into bite size cubes. And so then you're supposed to just add the pita and the halloumi to the salad, toss it and it's good to go. My tip would be to leave the pita chips or whatever you want to call them, pita pieces out and just top it with it. Because if you have leftovers, it's really nice to have it separate Um, because otherwise it gets soggy in the salad. But this was so good. And I was just thinking of all the changes you can make. So if you're vegan, you can just skip the halloumi completely, right? Um, If you do maybe like if you, I know some people struggle with like tomatoes or onion or whatever, you could totally leave that out. Um, gluten-free folks could get gluten-free pita or skip the pita. Super easy. 
Um, basically, you could just do anything with this, and I think it would be super easy to make changes to. Um, it was so good. I've made this like four times since I first made it. Um, the cookbook is public was published this year. Um, and it's just really light, but so refreshing and good. And I think that, um, like I said, so easy to modify. And also if you were serving it to people, like I said, you could have the pita on the side and that you could even leave the halloumi out. So it's like a vegan gluten-free thing as is, and then could be added in. Um, and I have a photo here of kind of it's what it looked like when I made it. And, um, really good and the cookbook itself um uh, cooking in real life is also there's a lot of great recipes in there so just a plug for that as well um that's a practical uh, recipes and really good ways to modify for dietary restrictions so that was my recipe pretty simple but really good and a great summer dish for sure as we are moving into the warmer months so I'll second that book is awesome. I've I loved it. Loved it. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. such a good cookbook. So I'm excited to hear that you shared something from that. Um, it sounds great. It sounds like what I had for lunch today, except for better. So <laughs> <laughs> like, I was like, yeah, I would totally add halloumi and pita chips to that. And it would be amazing. So yeah, that sounds great. And I love the idea of like kind of setting up a buffet for it too. I think that would work great. Yeah, that I I remember that recipe. I was really sad to have to give it back to the library. I know, right? Yeah, yeah. I tried to renew it, um, but yeah, yeah, I really liked that a lot. Yeah, and I bet with Katie's crispy chicken tenders, put that on top, and you have a whole entree. That would be so good. Absolutely, yeah. And maybe yeah, you some... could. Yeah, no, yeah, you could add ch chicken. I didn't even think about adding like a different protein but that would be that would make it a full full meal for sure yeah okay. um oh, okay beth time your turn right, well today i've got dessert um oh, perfect have, so i got this um book quick and easy quick and easy gluten-free by becky excel and but it's she and she's british so you know british recipes are a little bit different in this case, it's called self-saucing butterscotch pudding. Um, so I looked at, and it was like, well, that doesn't look like pudding. And then I, so I, I included this little anecdote on my recipe where um, a, a British woman had asked her family at a restaurant uh, if they wanted some pudding. Or just, uh, and the waiter said, oh, I'm sorry, we, we don't have pudding on our menu. And she said, oh, that's, that just um, a generic term we use for a sweet dessert. And the guy said, well, thank you for explaining the lyrics to um, The Wall. Do you know that? You know, you can't have your pudding if you don't eat your meat. I included that in the recipe too, because I never knew. Anyway, uh, self-sauce saucing butterscotch pudding so here's what it is so um and i chose to make something that was gluten and dairy free because my mom has restrictions and i was making this for her and it does have every recipe does have just a ways you can um alter it like use dairy free milk use lactose free milk use um and i did use gluten free flour that i already had in the in the house so it's just your basic uh, gluten mix. So it's a half a cup minus a tablespoon. You know, those British people, it's, well, it's a hundred grams of melted butter, 200 grams of the flour, two teaspoons of gluten-free baking powder. Well, that threw me for a loop. It turns out, I guess, normal, you know, American uh, baking powder is gluten-free. I think at one point, long, back in the day, it wasn't. But, um, and then some cinnamon, quarter cup of dark brown sugar, a half a cup of whole milk, which I use coconut milk, um, a large beaten egg, oh, and two tablespoons of golden syrup. Golden syrup. 
uh, it's kind of like a light corn syrup, but it's not really corn syrup, but I use um, agave. I either, yeah, I use agave. You could, you could use um, honey too when I looked it up. So, um, so in, in your bowl, you mix your, your dry goods and add your butter, milk, egg, and syrup until it's a thick batter. Spoon it into your prepared tin, which they, it was a weird size too. It was a seven by 11. I happen to have that size, but um, baking tin, parentheses, pan, in case you don't know. So, okay. Um, so you mix that, you put it in. And then for the sauce, you mix sugar, dark brown sugar, corn flour, or corn starch, uh, two cups of boiling water, a little vanilla and another tablespoon of golden syrup. So you mix all that, um, you you put in your batter and then you just pour that water over, over the cake. Mix the sugar and the corn flour really well. Sprinkle, oh, you sprinkle that, then you add the boiling water with vanilla and golden syrup or whatever. So you bake it for 35, 40 minutes until the sponge top is cooked. So it's like a bake, it's like a cake, but it's self-saucing. I have a picture of it just out of the oven and I have a picture of uh, a, a slice. Um, it does have this, you know, this butterscotchy sauce to it. Um, to be honest, I made it when I was not feeling well. I didn't have the same, the right appetite. Um, and also, I think just not like inadvertent sort of like maybe not liking it as much because it's gluten-free. I don't know, I, but I wasn't feeling well either, but it was like, I'd bite into it and be like, yeah, I don't know, but, but I could make it just, you know, with a regular, um, gluten flour if I want. And so, yeah, it's, it's very, uh, adaptable. And in this case too, my mom is able to have some butter in moderation, um, but you could probably use margarine for it, but it was, it was pretty cool. Self-saucing butterscotch pudding. <clears throat> so I, 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 I couldn't quite grasp the self-saucing. How is that? Why is it called that? So, because, um, you, you make, there's the cake. And then when you pour that, um, boiling water in the, in the agave, yeah. It, oh, it, 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 yeah. yeah, it makes it into a sauce like and the cornstarch on top too. Right. It. So uh, it just turns into a sauce. And okay. it's like drippy like a sauce, like it's still yeah. liquid. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's like a it's like a pool a pool in a pool of um of butterscotch sauce. Okay. Okay. It's pretty cool. good. It's good, but I'm kind you know, of imagining like a flan type of thing. Oh, kind of, except a little more cake, cakey, but yeah, but it is self-saucing and who doesn't love something that's self-saucing? I just love to say it too. Anyway. <laughs> I was going to say self-saucing. That's, we got to copyright that. Yeah. That's, yeah. No, I'm sorry. Becky XL might have, but <laughs> um, anyway, I thought it was kind of a clever little foray into British baking, you know, and absolutely. Uh, so, all right. I think I'll take us out unless anyone has any other comments. May I do some shameless plugging? Of course you may. Oh, if you are watching this, then that means that it's probably before July 7th. July 7th is when we'll have the author of this year's Big Gay Read. We are never meeting in real life. Samantha Irby will be at the library um, giving us a little talk, Q&A type of situation, and she'll also be available to sign books. Um, and then all throughout the month of July, we'll have all sorts of other events. Uh, we're doing Zumba, but think very gay. <laughs> um, we'll be having a vegan taste test. We'll be making uh, crafts and toys for your cats. We'll be doing all sorts of stuff throughout the month of July. So go to aadl.org slash the big gay read. Okay, that's all I got. So big, so gay. And we all if, if anything, it's gonna be big and it's gonna be gay. 
It's going to be a read. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Well, thank you for watching. And thanks for joining us today, Jacob. Be sure to Thank you for the, having me. Sure thing. Be sure to click the link below at the event page on ADL.org to find the recipes we talked about and share your own in the comments. Join us next time when we'll be looking at uh, some Ann Arbor history recipes. That's what we'll do. Thanks again. Thanks for sharing. Recipe share. Recipe share. Share a little recipe.